So today we're going to talk about vascular evaluation and access using ultrasound. Uh, so what procedures can we use ultrasound for? So as you can see, there are various things, uh, central venous lines, arterial lines, thoracentesis, pericardiocentesis, lumbar punctures. Uh, today we're really just going to talk about central venous access. <clears throat> so there are international evidence-based recommendations for ultrasound-guided vascular access, and most of the recommendations are based off of uh, these articles and also in some of the reading material. <clears throat> so you have focused questions, uh, just like any other bedside ultrasound procedure. Where is the target vessel, and is it patent? I think one of the most things that people forget is the patent aspect of evaluating these vessels. The probe you're going to use is the High Frequency Vascular Linear Array Probe, or Vascular Probe. Remember, these probes have low depth of penetration, but high resolution, so you have a good amount of ability to see the actual vessel. <clears throat> so a little bit about holding the probe before we move on. Uh, remember, you're supposed to hold it kind of like a thumb pen with just enough pressure to get the view. Uh, also, an external operator should be able to withdraw the probe from your hand without any effort. This will decrease fatigue in the long run. And also, one of the mistakes I see beginners make is they put too much pressure with their left hand on the probe so that they collapse the vessels <clears throat> that they're trying to evaluate. The first step is recognizing the vascular couple. You could use a, a thing called Carmen Maneuver, which is moving the skin on top of the underneath skin uh, to distinguish between cysts, hematomas, lymph nodes, and muscles. That can be reviewed in the basics lecture. <clears throat> so again, let's take, for example, the evaluation of the internal jugular vein because that's the most frequently accessed vein using ultrasound. Uh, what you want to see is the vascular couple here you see the internal jugular vein marked with blue and the carotid artery marked with red. <clears throat> a few other things of how to distinguish the vein from the artery. The artery is usually round. The vein is ovoid, triangular, or collapsed. The vein is usually larger, although this may not always be the case, especially when you have critically ill, sick patients, dehydrated, um, Artery has systolic movements, but remember the vein can also have systolic movements, especially when it's very close to the artery. <clears throat> the vein lumen has valves, and the arteries can have calcifications. You can use the usual anatomical locations. <clears throat> also pathological, within veins, you, can't, you might see a thrombosis where they're not as typical in the artery. Remember, mild pressure compresses the vein. And this is important not only for correct access, but important for documentation. The correct amount of pressure is just enough pressure to collapse the artery, mild compression of the artery. If you compress so hard that the, both the artery and the vein collapse, that's probably a little bit too much compression. Another way is you can use color Doppler, uh, which is mentioned later in the, in the presentation and also shows some clips. <coughs> So when you're recognizing the patency of the vein, remember this is important for the procedure, for the patient, the documentation, the billing, and it's really just good medicine. There are a couple of ways, definitions that we use. The first one is static, which is a simple observation. The internal jugular is usually black. Uh, the subclavian vein and femoral usually are a little bit more uh, grayish. Remember to compare both sides, look for foreign bodies. Previously, when ultrasound was first used, for access, people use a static method where they try to find the uh, vein and artery and couple and then um, you know would not use direct guidance for the actual access. Now we actually use dynamic, uh, which you actually can see the respiratory changes and the needle tip is visualized throughout the whole process. So once you've identified the correct site, you actually are evaluating and watching the needle tip throughout the whole process. <coughs> Remember, to recognize the patency, you have to use controlled or mild pressure. Strong pressures can collapse uh, fresh thrombus and may even collapse an artery with low pressures. Uh, so you may mistake an uh, artery for a vein. Uh, may dislodge a thrombus, 
Probably not, but some people uh, think that it could if it's a fresh new cloud. Remember, you can always use Doppler or color, color Doppler. Uh, remember, color is not, um, red, red does not equal artery and blue does not equal vein. Really, if blood is flowing towards your ultrasound probe, it will show up as red, and blood flowing away from your ultrasound probe will be showing up blue. <clears throat> so here's an example of what uh, proper collapse amount is. You can see the artery is just mildly collapsed. The artery is the vessel on the bottom. The vein is the collapsible vein that you see collapsing on each one of these images. <clears throat> Here's a still picture of a thrombus. Uh, you can see the thrombus inside of the vein. Here's an example of what I mean with the color Doppler. So if you can see, just focus on the vessel on top. You can see that the blue turns to red. And essentially what's happening is, depending on whether you're in the femoral region or the carotid neck region, the blue just means that the blood is flowing away from the probe and red means the blood is flowing towards. So you should use that to kind of identify whether the vein, whether the vessel is a vein or an artery. A few things about vascular axis, especially on the short axis, are mistakes that I see. So on the left, you see a picture of the probe um, and the and the suspected vessel. Could be, for example, one centimeter down. What I see a lot of people do is where they actually want to access the vessel. They end up trying to use the needle, they use your needle um, axis right where your ultrasound probe is. And if you see on this, the red arrow marks where your ultrasound probe is in relation to your needle tip. And you can see even before you get to the vessel that you have lost your needle tip. So what you should do is if you see that the, the vessel is two centimeters below, you should start your uh, insertion two centimeters behind where you think that you would want to get the final insertion point. And then what you would do is actually move your ultrasound probe back two centimeters to where you're inserting your needle to be able to opt optimally visualize the needle tip. This is just showing uh, image in long axis. It's not preferred. Uh, it is a little bit more difficult procedure to perform. If you have a large vessel and a relatively immobile area of the patient or the patient is paralyzed or sedated, then sometimes doing long access does make your needle uh, more visual, visualized, um, but it's recommended to just start with short access. <coughs> so here's someone going from short access to long access. <coughs> So a few tips, uh, on some patients when they have really thick neck skin or uh, thick skin in general or a short neck, I tend uh, to see that beginners uh, when they're doing the ultrasound needle guidance, they puncture the skin and they really try to follow the needle tip from the skin insertion point. But what happens is they have to put so much pressure with their needle that they actually go two to three centimeters in and then they pull retract back to the beginning. And during that time, you're not really sure where your needle tip is. So what I actually do is I put a small cut on the skin where you plan to enter uh, with your 11 blade because in most of these um, procedures, you are going to be putting a, a blade at some point anyway uh, to be able to put the dilator through. Remember, check both sides. 68% uh, of the right, 68 of the time, the right side is better for the internal jugular but that means 32% of the time the left side is larger and better. So a lot of times before we, uh, we the way we teach here is before we even prep and drape, uh, we actually check both sides to get the optimal side. You can actually tilt the probe towards the needle tip in the short axis approach. Um, and that's a, that's a skill that as you practice more and more, you might just do even without thinking. Remember, visualize the needle tip. It's not as useful to measure the shaft of the needle because your needle tip may actually be in the, in the artery if you're just looking at the shaft part of the needle. If collapsing and have to do in that location, uh, try the long catheter that is available in the kit. Also, you could just take a picture of the catheter or the wire prior to dilation, which is what we recommend, is that you take a picture of the wire before you uh, dilate the skin. <clears throat> 
If you are using that, there's no need to actually make a vacuum as you're advancing. Remember, you should be able to see your needle tip throughout the whole process. And when you see that your needle tip is in the center of the vein, uh, you can actually slide the long catheter through. <coughs> a, few, a few other pitfalls. In the long axis, if you lose the needle tip, do not move the probe. Redirect the needle towards the probe. Uh, in the short axis, not visualizing the needle tip through the whole process is a pitfall. Pressing too hard, not using the appropriate technique. Poor preparation, not looking at the target prior to starting the procedure. <coughs> and last, not practicing on models prior attempting on real possible moving target. <coughs> One of, uh, in ultrasound, they call them ultrasound phantoms. Uh, and if you do not have access to a phantom, actually tofu works really well. Um, you can just buy some tofu and when you use the probe, all you have to do is set your gain setting a little bit higher. I typically take the um, opening cap of a Coke or a Pepsi can and I put uh, it inside the tofu and have students visualize their needle tip all the way to the cap, all the way to the uh, Coke cap uh, to be able to uh, get practice on the hand-eye coordination. <coughs> Also, what can you do afterward? Remember, you can use the guide wire stage to confirm guide wire in the vein, which is uh, mandatory in all our patients here in the intensive care unit and emergency room prior to dilating the, the vein. Uh, you can check for pneumothorax. You can check the same side of the internal jugular to make sure it's in the appropriate place. For instance, when you're placing a subclavian line ultrasound guided, a lot of times the line goes towards the right neck you can also check to see if there's any hematoma form. If the subclavian can check, uh, you can check the internal jugular to make sure the guide wire is going appropriately towards the heart. Here's a, here's a three second clip that shows someone uh, in our ICU evaluating whether the vein, whether the guide wire is in the vein. And what they're doing is they're showing it in the short axis view. I also recommend once they see it in the short axis view to turn the probe 90 degrees so that they can see it in the long axis. Here's a picture of the guide wire in long axis. Uh, optimally, you want to save at least one of these, but even both is okay to kind of show that you know you're in the correct spot before you dilate the vein. Here's a here's a vein here's a guide wire that actually was placed probably in the thrombus, and that's why. Uh, you see the uh, little bit of a grayish echogenicity to the vein. But again, um, patient uh, was evaluated for collapsibility prior to. <coughs> a few slides about subclavian vein axis. Uh, there's a few really good articles that came out a few years ago on ultrasound-guided subclavian can cannulation versus landmark technique. And essentially, most of these studies uh, showed that, you know, it is possible to use a subclavian vein. It's probably actually the axillary vein that we're cannulating. So essentially, the probe is placed longitudinally right over the clavicle. And the first thing that you're going to see on the probe when I show um, students how to do it is you're going to see a clavicle in short axis. I will actually show a couple of slides of that. Once you go a little bit more laterally, uh, you can actually compress under the clavicle with your free hand and you can actually see the subclavian vein collapsing. <clears throat> Some people recommend to do it in long axis, but I find this very difficult, especially in the uh, region that we're trying to access the vein. So our, my recommendation is to do it in short axis. <clears throat> this article was really good and it kind of, just kind of shows a lot of images of what uh, kind of wires and catheters that they were using. So this article is uh, one of the reading materials and available reading materials on the website. So again, as I mentioned, when you're using subclavian vein access, as you can see in this study and a few others afterward, you can see that the access time, the success rate, the average number of attempts, uh, and all the complications were less in the ultrasound group versus landmark. And this is just for subclavian vein. <coughs> So here's a picture of what I normally, I usually put the probe right on top of the clavicle so that I know my landmark. And then as I go out laterally towards the shoulder, you can actually see the subclavian vein kind of pop out in short axis. Also, you can actually see the first rib and the pleura below if you increase your depth just slightly. And once you get better, you can actually position yourself where your axis point 
um, angle will go towards the first rib and not towards the lung. And that actually prevents you from hitting the, hitting the lung, which is the complication that we don't really want. <laughs> so this, this lecture talked about central venous axis. Hopefully it helped you out a little bit, uh, central venous axis and evaluation. And uh, thanks for listening.